He is the creator and sustainer of all the worlds, whether those worlds are known or unknown to mankind. eyes unclouded by hate does not wisdom cry and understanding put forth her voice hello everyone my name's charlie you might know me better as sci-fi fantasy writer c.e dorset and today we're going to be continuing our read through of the prophet by khalil gibran i i wanted to start today by saying i'm sorry there wasn't an episode yesterday um there was some family things that had to happen and everything's I think okay, but you know, it just ate up the entire day and I'm sorry I did not get an episode out. So, and we continue. So we've already talked about love and today we're going to talk about marriage. So let's go straight to the text. Then Almitra spoke again and said, and what of marriage master? And he answered saying, you were born together, and together you shall be forevermore. You shall be together when the white wings of death scatter your days. I, you shall be together even in the silent memory of God. But let there be spaces in your togetherness, and let the winds of heaven dance between you. Hmm. This is one of those places where I feel like there needs to be some step in and we need to talk about. Okay. So you were born together and together shall you be forever more. Um, this is easy to interpret and interpret, interpret as the idea of having a soulmate. And while I don't want to get into it too much on this episode, but if you want, we can. There's a wonderful Kabbalistic idea of soul gravity, which is the idea that there are certain souls that are drawn to each other and that seek each other out. And I think that there is some truth to that. Um, I, I'm not endorsing the idea of soul mates in particular here. I don't believe that there is one person for everyone out there and that you have to find that one person. Now that may sound strange coming from someone like me, who's been married for over 21 years, but that when we found each other, there was no guarantee that we would end up together. And that's something that I think is very important. I don't think that there's just one person out there. For everyone, I think that there are numerous people that we could end up having fulfilling relationships with. And to simplify things down to the idea that there is only one is beautifully romantic, but not quite accurate. Now, having said that, I think the basic sentiment here is true. You know, you were born together and together shall you be forevermore. That experientially is my experience with not only my husband, but with all of the people that I've ever been in love with. If you don't f feel that match, if you don't feel that connection to another person, I don't think you can have the experience of love. And at least the initial stirrings of love. But what, what this says to me more than anything else, and this is born out of my experience of, you know, having been married for so long, we were born together. We, we had lives prior to meeting. We had experiences and relationships prior to meeting. But I think our actual birth was when we came together as a couple. Because that's when our lives intertwined and the new people that we would grow into being came into being. 
That's, that's when that started, that new life started. And so we were, in a sense, born together, but not born destined for one another, if that makes any sense to you. That the relationship that we have built over the years has strengthened the bond between us and our understanding of one another. And without it, neither one of us would be who we are. You shall be together when the white wings of death scatter your days. Yeah, we will always be connected. No matter how long we are together in this life or going on, there there, there will never be a way to separate the two of us. Even if, God forbid, something were to happen and we did go our separate ways in this life, we have been a part of each other's life for so long that not even death will truly be able to separate us one from the other. Uh, we will be together in this, even the silent memory of God, but let there be spaces in your togetherness and let the winds of heaven dance between you. Yeah, this is very important for relationships because we've talked a lot about how, you know, the bonds of love intertwine people and hold people together I think one of the things that gets lost in the concept of a relationship is how there needs to be, with that closeness, some distance. And so you'll end up having friends that are not in common. You'll end up having interests that are not necessarily in common. And learning to allow that space to exist within the relationship is so key to the relationship survival. And not something that, well, it's something that when it's talked about, it's often done in a very misogynistic sort of way that, you know, men are going to have their thing. So, you know, let boys be boys and the girls will be girls. And it's not that sort of a thing The oh, I don't want to go into the gender binary on this episode, but that's not what we're talking about here. It's, you know, I have my interests. Brian has his interests and we've learned to make room for those separate interests. But at the same time, we have so much in common. We are always together, even when we're apart. If any of that makes sense. Continuing from the text, love one another, but make not a bond of love. Let it rather be a moving sea between the shores of your souls. Fill each other's cup but drink not from one cup. Give one another your bread, but eat not the same loaf. Sing and dance together and be joyous, and let each one of you be alone. Even as the strings of a lute are alone, though they quiver with the same music. And this is what we were talk- talking about. It's about having that space and allowing for the propriety of that space so that we're in- the goal of a proper relationship, despite what a romance novel will tell you or what various strains of romantic culture will tell you. It's n- the goal is not to develop a codependent relationship with each other. Codependence does nothing but bind you and hold you and keep you from actually developing and having a life that is your own. So yeah, make sure that you are learning to be together and to be individuals. And I think that that's a lesson that we as a society (laughs) need to learn is we either focus on our collective identities or our individuality, but it's learning that those two things together are what makes the chorus that is civilization. That it's that tension between the individual strings singing their notes separately and together. That's what makes life sweet, and that's what makes life worth living. Give your hearts 
Returning to the text, sorry. Give your hearts, but not into each other's keeping. For only the hands of life can contain your hearts. And stand together, yet not too near together. For the pillars of the temple stand apart. And the oak tree and the cypress grow not in each other's shadow. The... I love that he focuses so much on this because this is the one aspect of a relationship that is often overlooked. And that is giving each other space, giving each other the place to grow, that we're here to support each other. We're here to help each other. We're here to grow together. But I am not here to keep another and that they are not here to keep me. And when you can get that thought in your mind, that individually we have to learn to grow so that together we are stronger than the sum of our parts, that's the lesson that marriage teaches and why I find marriage to be an essential and important part of life. It's one of the reasons why I and others fought so hard for marriage equality because the ideal of marriage is people building a life together. And in so doing, we have to weather off some of our rougher edges, as we talked about yesterday, or in the last episode, on the nature of love, that love will kind of rub off those harder edges and that it will prune. But at the same time, realizing that it's not your place to correct or perfect anyone but yourself. And you can help your partner should your partner wish it, but it is not your job. It is not your place. It is not your purpose in this world to perfect them because that perfection is something that they can only attain if they strive for it themselves. And most of us will never find perfection in this life. Some will, but most of us will benefit solely from the striving, solely from the reaching out, the trying to get there. Only when we allow each other that space to realize that, yes, we were born together. Yes, our lives and our fates are intertwined, but I cannot live in your shadow. You cannot live in my shadow. You have, this is where I, I don't know if anybody remembers the song, the wind beneath your wings, but the wind beneath my wings, but the song compared to where it is in the movie, it's from the movie beaches. I think in the movie, it has a much different meaning than the song does if you just listen to it by itself. Because the whole point of the song where it occurs is, one, you don't realize how much someone has done to help you if you're not paying attention for it. But at the same time, you don't want to put somebody in your shadow. You know, it must have, the opening lines of the song are, it must have been cold there in my shadow to never feel sunlight on your face. And I think people miss that phrase in the opening of the song that yes, we're here to help each other, but we don't want to overshadow and hold people down. This is the basic problem that we have with the hierarchical nature of our current societies, where we feel that there is a leader and there are followers and that poison gets injected into marriage and family to the point where, you know, families, dissolve and they break up because there isn't a leader. Families grow based off of consensus and off of learning to benefit from the strengths and learning to, you know, mollify and um, repair the weaknesses of each other. And so if there's a, this blind obeyance to the idea that you have to bow your head and do what you're told because the leader has said so, 
there's not a chance to question the leader's flaws and there's not a chance for the followers to grow. And this is what we learn in marriage. And this is what we learn in this wonderful chapter on marriage, that we are here to grow with one another, to aid each other, to help each other, but not to overshadow each other. It's all about mutuality. And that is a beautiful thing. After the break, we will continue with the next chapter in The Prophet on Children. And we're back. And so let's just go right into the text. And a woman who held a babe against her bosom said, Speak to us of children. And he said, Your children are not your children. They are the sons and daughters of life's longing for itself. They come through you, but not from you. And though they are with you, yet they belong not to you. This is, I think, so important for people to understand because I have seen in the relationships that I've had with others how their parents sometimes viewed them as their property and as uh, people that they could do whatever they wanted to with. And that is not a good thing. That is not a thing that should be. And it's very important for us to understand this, that we do not own other people. And I would think that in the 21st century, that would be something that didn't bear repeating. That's something that we didn't have to say over and over and over again. But it 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 does. You, you don't own other people, whether it's your spouse or your children, you don't own them. Just load up the Leslie Gore song, sing along. Let's continue from the text. You may give your love, sorry, you may give them your love, but not your thoughts, for they have their own thoughts. You may house their bodies, but not their souls. For their souls dwell in a house of tomorrow, which you cannot visit, nor even, not even in your dreams. You may strive to be like them, but seek not to make them like you. For life goes not backward, nor tarries with yesterday. You are the boughs from which which your children as living arrow sorry you are the bows from which your children as living arrows are sent forth the archer sees the mark upon the path of the infinite and he bends you with his might and his arrows may go swift and far let your bending in the archer's hand be for gladness, for even as he loves the arrow that flies, he also, I'm sorry, so he loves also the bow that is stable. Oh, there's so much to unpack here. So as we were talking about how a child is not owned by their parents, just as no one owns anybody because nobody owns anyone. I don't want to have to keep saying that. We need a society to get that through our head. I love this. You may give them your love, but not your thoughts. This is one of the biggest bones of contention I know I have with my family. And I see this with my friends, with their families, either with their parents or with their children. You can give them your love, but not your thoughts they will think for themselves. And that's a good thing. And the best thing that you can do for a child is teach them how to think, teach them how to explore the world, how to have curiosity, and encourage them to grow and flourish as best as they can. For as the prophet says, they have their own thoughts. We all do. And it's remarkable to me how, as children... The one thing that we want most from our parents is to be seen as an adult who has the right to make their own decisions and to not be judged 
for not making the same decisions that our parents would make, only to turn around and do the same to children. And I, I, I phrase it that way, which sounds a little awkward, but I don't have any kids. <laughs> I, I want kids, but we don't have any. This is something that is so important to learn. And I think this is something that, like with a lot of the insights that can be gleaned from the prophet, something that needs to be learned for all of our lives. Not just our relationship with our um, physical children, but with those who inherit our philosophies or our stories. Those people that we nurture in life. I have a lot of people that refer to me in a parental way because they know that they can come to me for advice, for solace, and that I will take care of them. And it's one of the great joys of my life. And I think we miss that when we think of what it means to have children. I mean, the Apostle Paul refers to everyone that he brought into Christianity as his children and said that he struggled in labor with them until Christ be born within. And I think any of us, especially those of us who are trying to impart any kind of spiritual insight, need to understand that our insight may not be the same as those that we endeavor to share it with. And that's where danger <laughs> lies. That's where the cults form when you believe that you have to have conformity to the group think that you have to agree with whoever is giving spiritual direction to the group or else you're wrong in so much as anyone picks up the lessons that I try to share or the teachings that I have inherited and I'm trying to pass on. Those people are my spiritual children and it's important for us, especially those of us who are trying to share our mystical insight with others, to have the humility of a parent in understanding that others have different experiences than us, and some people have to learn for themselves. And even when we are trying to be helpful, we have to walk the line and not cross over into being critical or condemning. One of the biggest problems that exists within all spiritual communities today is the instinct to condemn the instinct to point out the faults and the flaws in others to the detriment of the actual message that you're trying to get across. This is one of the reasons why in the United States and in many European countries, Christianity is collapsing because they've made it all about nitpicking faults instead of actually helping people, you know, doing the actual work of the gospel. And so we have to, as a spiritual family, just as you would in a, you know, physical family, learn that humility not to force our own thoughts on others. For their souls dwell in the house of tomorrow, which you cannot visit, not even in your dreams. And that's true. Those that we are sending out into the world, again, our spiritual or physical children, they are going to see and do things that we cannot imagine. And we have to be okay with that. One of my favorite lines in the section is the next one. You may strive to be like them, but seek not to make them like you for life does not go backward nor tarries with yesterday. So many people long for the good old days. I hear that often. And yeah, I, I have, I, I'm, susu I'm as susceptible to those notions of nostalgia as anybody else. You know, I remember when I was in high school and I had a very close knit group of friends and life was easy because I had a job and I didn't have to pay bills while I had, you know, 
I was a kid in the 90s, so I had a pager. And I also had a phone line to the house because cell phones weren't really a thing yet because they were really expensive. So I had those bills. But beyond that, you know, any money that I made was fun money. And I think that's more than anything what we're nostalgic for. It's not so much that life was better in the 90s, though, you know, peace, prosperity, you know, there was some good times. (laughs) But... You know, as far as everything else goes, there was racism, there was rampant homophobia and sexism, and the partisan divide was bad then. And, you know, they tried to impeach a president for cheating on his wife. I mean, the partisan divide has always been bad. So we're able to paper over those things because, you know, I didn't have to worry about paying the rent. I didn't have to worry about buying food. You know, food was just there because I lived with my parents because I was a kid. And so it's easy to have rose colored glasses when looking back and being nostalgic for the good old days, especially as you get older and life gets more complicated and you have more obligations on you because you've taken on more things. You look back at those older days and you think to yourself, oh, the good old days, but they weren't really the good old days. What you're actually longing for is that sense of being carefree that you had back then. I know for me, that's really what it is. Anytime I think back then, it was about, you know, I miss having that tight knit group of friends that we would go out every night and do crazy things and run wild through the woods and just, you know, be the wild child that I was. And I miss that. But I couldn't go back to that now, even if I wanted to, because I'm older. I'm 42. My knees don't work as well as they used to. My back has issues. You know, I couldn't run through a forest if, you know, I had to right now. But I miss it. And that kind of nostalgia is where things get dangerous. It's not that I miss anything particular about the time. Did I like the music better back then? I I really don't know. Because, yeah, there was a lot of music that was out at the time that I enjoyed, and I still enjoy, but I always liked music from the 60s and 70s and 80s. And there's a lot of music that's come out since that I really love. So it's not like music was particularly better back then. I was lucky that the types of music that I liked were more popular and easier to find and come across. But other than that... You know, music wasn't that different. Society really wasn't that different. And in some ways, it's actually gotten better. So, that's important for us to realize. When we think back about the good old days, we're either thinking about a mythical past that our parents or grandparents talked about, or we're thinking about the carefree days that we had before we really had to be concerned with the challenges of living. And we're not actually missing those things that we misapply because they're things that we think that we can bring to our life. Well, if we just had the political policies or this, that, or the other thing, if the social norms from when I was younger were still in effect, those aren't the things that changed that made life seem harder. The things that changed are, generally speaking, that we have responsibilities now. And so we have to strive to go forward and not back. And that's a hard thing to do. And this beautiful image of seeing ourselves as a bow and the children as the arrow and seeing God himself as the archer. That is such a beautiful way to look at this. We are the tool through which they are sent forward. The vehicle from which they go forth. But we're not the hand that sends them. And this goes back to something that we talk about, we've talked about a lot, and we're going to continue talking about, and that's that unseen hand of providence that guides and helps us throughout our lives. These are important lessons for us to learn, and they're encapsulated in such simple, beautiful, poetic wording. I hope you're enjoying our read-through of The Prophet by Khalil Gibran as much as I am. This is a book that really means a lot to me, and... 
I love to be, that I'm able to share it with you and have these talks. If you've enjoyed this episode and the app that you're listening to me on allows you to rate either this podcast or this episode, please do that. That tells the algorithms that they should share me with more people and that helps the podcast to grow. If you've got a dollar or so you can spread, send my way, depending on the app that you're listening to me on, there'll either be a button that says support or in the show notes, there'll be a link that says support on anchor. If you click that, you can support me at the $1, $5 or $10 levels. That money goes to me and helps me to pay for, you know, upkeep on the, on the website and, you know, the various things that I do. It's recently helped me to buy some software that I needed to make the eBooks better. And I want to say thank you to everybody who has supported. If you don't have any money to help or you just don't feel like doing it, that's fine. I, it, I, honestly, I don't do this for the cash. I do this because I love talking to you, but what you could do is pray for me. That really does help. The power of prayer is a great and wondrous thing. And if you could just say, include me in your prayers, that would be wonderful. And if you know anybody that you think would enjoy this podcast, please share with them. That also helps out a lot. I, I am enjoying this series. I hope you are. You can find links to everything that I do over at wisdomscry.com. And until next time, may God bless you and keep you ever growing in wisdom and in compassion. Amen.